All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to our glaucoma uh, service rounds this morning. It's great to have everyone here and many uh, attending virtually as well. So, um, you know, we're just kind of uh, introduce our division a little bit here and then, and then talk about several things today. So in our glaucoma division 2023, we have these eight providers uh, that are our full-time providers. And then our two fellows, as you know very well, Paul and Sean, our research fellow, John, and, uh, you know, we run a busy service. So just some stats from 2022, our division uh, saw over 20,000 patients, did 1,900 uh, surgeries, saw 1,900 new patients, had about 350 clinical procedures and about 3,800 clinical tests like visual fields and OCTs. So uh, it's, a, it's a great service, great group of people. I love working with them. And, um, uh, you know, we all keep pretty busy, which has been uh, really a lot of fun and, and rewarding. So, um, what we're going to do today is first, uh, Craig's going to give us a little tech and research update, and then we're going to have some case presentations and some other information from Paul and Barb and Sean. So we'll just jump right into it and have Craig come first, and uh, we'll get started. Oh yeah, uh, there is no CME today, so just FYI. All right, thank you, Noah, I appreciate it. So I'm gonna be giving our Moran's Glaucoma Service Technology and Research Update. It's gonna be just really an update on what we have to offer in terms of in our service line. Okay, great, these are my financial disclosures which may be relevant to this discussion. As far as diagnostics, we have not a whole lot in terms of new tools available, but I do wanna just mention briefly the Maya instrument. The Maya has been used by our macular degeneration researchers, primarily to look at the sensitivity of the macula. But as we know, many of us are using 10-2 periodically to look for early glaucoma in the macular region, uh, and this might be helpful. The advantage of microperimetry is it has gaze tracking, so it's easier for patients to continue with the test rather than having to be looking across and having a lot of fixation losses. So that is one advantage. So it's a research tool. It's easy to update into access if you need to look at those images, um, but it's not something that we currently have access at every location, mainly here at the Moran, as well as our Mid-Valley location. Um, as far as other diagnostics, we continue to have our main staples. We have uh, Dr. Harry running our ultrasonography unit, uh, as well as ERG testing with Dr. Creel and Henry. In addition, we have other things that we wanna mention. Many of you know that glaucoma is not just one risk factor. We have multiple risk factors that we're addressing. And just a reminder that if you need to order sleep apnea consultation and a 24-hour blood pressure test, those are all orders within EPIC. Uh, the 24-hour blood pressure test works as a library card system. The EKG lab has a number of devices to rent out and check out, and those can be per, uh, picked up and then I usually just use rule out nocturnal hypotension as the reason and indication to do a 24-hour blood pressure test. As far as medical therapy, nothing's really changed. We continue to have our staples. SLT has really become first line for many of us based on the light trial. Uh, we also have Darista, which is our only injectable medication. It's a Darista uh, intracamel bimatoprost implant. Surgical care. Plumbers need tools and we have a lot. <laughs> so I'm just gonna break this down in terms of what we have available. As far as trabecular micro bypass stents, we have the iStent Inject W and the Hydrus. Uh, hopefully later this year, we'll have the iStent Infinite, which will be three stents loaded on the same injector. For viscodilation, we have two systems, the iTrack microcatheter and the Omni system. For goniotomy, we have KDB, which is the Kahook dual blade. The Trabex Pro, which is similar to the Kahook dual blade, but it has infusion hooked up that you can hook up to your FACO machine to have continuous infusion and aspiration. The Streamline is a unique tool which is used to create microgoniotomies as well as viscodilation. And we also have traditional suture or eye track GAD as well. Uh, the Zen Gel Stent is still available. Uh, we have the first generation Zen Gel Stent. Uh, hopefully in the future, uh, maybe in a couple of years when there's pivotal data here in the United States, uh, we'll have the larger lumen size. But for right now, we have the uh, current iteration which I believe is 45 microns internal lumen. Trabeculectomy, you know, despite all this new technology, we are still doing a ton of trabeculectomies on our service line. And our, our fellows this year have been quite busy managing those trabeculectomies in clinic as well. 
As far as glaucoma drainage devices, uh, we have just one new player on that, that uh, uh, spectrum. The Ahmed valve is our only valve device currently. And as far as non-valve devices, we have the bare valve, Maltino, and the clear path. We continue to have cyclophotocoagulation options, both endoscopic and transcleral. As far as research, I'm really pleased that the Crandall Center has been busy. Uh, we've conducted three rabbit studies this year, uh, thanks to John Musser, who's led all these studies. Uh, there have been two titratable glaucoma drainage devices studied with MyraVision, as well as one Exmer laser tuberculostomy with LAOS. For the future, we have uh, potentially two to three more studies that are coming online. One will be with the EPTFE, which is Gore-Tex. Uh, this device is a plate made out of Gore-Tex, and so we'll be studying that in, in rabbits first. And then also, Corneat has this glaucoma Eshan, which is really a novel glaucoma drainage device because it's draining into the intraconal space, which presumably has less fibrosis activity and may actually be a really great source for, for refractory cases. As far as basic science work, we have everything ranging from genetics to conventional outflow homeostasis uh, with Dr. Fiona McDonald, our newest hire, and also therapeutics and neuroprotection with Dr. Kurisic lab. As far as other clinical research that's occurring, Brian Stagg has been busy with statistical modeling for personalized glaucoma care, as well as clinical decision support tools, as well as clinical trials are on the for, um, forefront. And we have three that are hopefully gonna start here in Q3. We have external Zengel stent, which is not really new per se, but it's a new delivery style uh, to receive the on-label indication for the ab external technique. We're really happy that we have now supracortal shunts in the future coming. And we have two that will be starting hopefully in Q3 this year, the supracoidal scleral biostent, which is a biostent made out of banked sclera. Uh, so it's a device, but it's technically a biostent and not a hardware polymer of any kind. We also will have the supracoidal mini-ject, uh, which is a proprietary material known as STAR. And this material looks like a honeycomb and will hopefully provide a nice drainage channel uh, using the mini-ject device. As far as other research that we have going on, we have a lot of retrospective and outcomes research. Dr. Orozco is leading our suit exfoliation comorbidity, comorbidity studies, as well as the nictohemeral IOP patterns uh, using eye care home serial to home tonometry. We have a number of other MIGS outcome studies looking at ABIC hydrus, multi-centered GAT, as well as the hydrus positioning, uh, looking at outcomes of, of how that correlates with hydrus positioning post-operative outcomes. Finally, we have something that I've termed innovation activities or innovation initiatives through the Crandall Center. These are just a smattering of things that we've been involved with in the last year in terms of new technology, things that are coming in the future. One that I'm really particularly pleased about is, you know, I know I hammer most of the trainees about how to hold a gonio prism, but we now have a hands-free option uh, that will be mounted onto the biome, uh, which will actually provide the ability to stabilize the eye better for certain cases. Uh, in addition, uh, we're working on a virtual rally gonioscopy module with VR Fundamental. Uh, that's been slow because of funding, but we hope that that will become something that all educational programs will have in the future. So thank you. But that was our technology and uh, research updates. I'll turn it over to the rest of my colleagues. We're going to have a little change of order here. Uh, Paul and Craig need to go to the OR, so we'll have uh, Dr. Chamberlain go next. So being in Utah, I thought stuck between a rock and a hard place, stuck between a soft and a hard place is a pretty apropos um, title for a, a glaucoma talk. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so get right into a patient presentation. This is an 82-year-old female um, complaining, you know, blurred vision, hypotony in the right eye uh, for two months following a trabeculectomy bleb revision. Um, so it's been ongoing since the revision. She has a history of uh, POAG in both eyes, also um, past you know, surgical histories that cataract surgery in both eyes, SLT in both eyes, trabeculectomy in the right eye um, in, in 2022, a blood revision a, a little over a month later um, because the sutures were cut, pressure still had not come down. Um, and so you know, uh, basically went in with the um, MVR blade, opened up the flap and she's been hypotenuse since then. So that is the, you know, the etiology of her hypotony. The left eye has also had a cataract with a nice dent, um, trab, and then an express shunt um, 
sorry, has had an expression, not a trap and an expression. And then a bleb revision, and that, and that one also went, went, went well. Our pressure has been 10. Um, not currently on any drops and no relevant past medical history. On exam, vision in the right eye is 2070. Um, Pre-op, uh, before her, her TRAB and revision, she was 2025 in that eye. Left eye is 2030, but that's with a minus three. Um, and her right eye really is her good eye. I'll show you the visual field in a second, but the left eye is significantly affected by uh, glaucoma. Uh, no RAPD because uh, of severe glaucoma in both eyes. IOP is two and 10, full motility, restricted visual fields. This is, what, this is a 10-2, um, you know, uh, really approaching fixation, but you can see the left eye is worse than the right. So she's very, very bothered by her right eye. Um, and on exam, uh, just significant things here, you know, beautiful from a glaucoma perspective, absolutely perfect bleb. <laughs> Morphology looks good. It's not leaking, um, it's diffuse, elevated, but the pressure's too. Um, uh, left eye also, you know, good, good bleb, chamber deep. Uh, on DFE, she's, you know, significantly cupped a nerve with not just to the inferior rim, uh, moderate choroidal effusions on the left eye. For those um, for the residents, especially, kind of think of choroidal effusions. You know, mild is you can just see them out in the periphery. Moderate, maybe starting to come into the you know arcades a little bit, um, but not really affecting you know macula. And if they're you know kissing or or close over the macula, that's kind of you know severe. So these are moderate, you know, pretty good size, but but still not in you know central vision. She might notice them sometimes, but not all the time. Um, so. Next steps, and I, I warned the PGY4s ahead of time that I might be calling on them just because I, I, I hate to talk for 15 minutes. So I'm gonna, uh, Cole, uh, would you mind, what, what are our options here? What, what can we do for this patient? Do nothing, that is a great option. And the one, we, we have actually, at this point, scheduled the patient to go back to the OR, I think three times and each time, you know, we're saying, okay, we're gonna do an exam the same day, and we've convinced her, let's just, let's just give it a little more time. The pressure is going to come up. It's going to be fine. You know, let's just, so waiting is a great option. We already feel like, I mean, if it were up to us, we'd say, yes, let's just keep waiting. Patient has decided, no, I, I, I don't want to wait any longer. So what, are, what else could we do? Okay. Right. Um, great. And, and uh, Dr. Seg, I forgot, had you already filled at one point? I don't think I early, early on. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, I, I actually did not put that on here, but we had filled multiple times at this point or yeah, a couple of times. Um, so yeah, watch and wait revision and the revisions. You, I think you mentioned all these, you know, compression sutures, blood patch, open content, close the flap. And you, you know, you could combine these with drainage of choroidals if, if you wanted to. Yeah. So if they're macular folds, those can become more chronic and hard to, um, you know, hard to get rid of. So if, if she has severe macular folds, then that's going to push us more towards doing something sooner rather than later, because uh, with hypotony too long, those won't necessarily go away. But if her macula is okay, um, also, you know, kissing choroidal, severe choroidals will, will push us. Um, and then, you know, this is not quite as like urgent, but just, you know, if, she, if this is her functional eye, which is kind of what pushed us to do something at this point. Yeah. Right, right yeah, Fla a, a, flat, a flat AC um, with, yeah. And I can pick one of the problems you know, hypotony is kind of defined as, in my mind, it's defined as patient thinking not knowing. So, right. so a pressure of four or three, Right. And you can have a patient with a pressure of seven who has hypotony, even though you kind of think, why? Yeah, but. Okay. Um, so we proceeded, and I'm going to. Um, my laptop died last night, so I wasn't able to link all my videos to this. Um, so let me pull up the video here. This is a 
a video of the first surgery. Um, so these are, these are compression sutures. I show this video just because it's something that's not very common. So just kind of seeing, so essentially going at the limbus and then this is, we had are already done a blood patch. So basically just injected her own blood subconjunctivally. This throw right here, just trying to, um, it's kind of blind, but you're just grabbing a little bit of sclera. Um, and then, you know, really just you're, you know, tightening it down. Now these sutures do not come out. You don't actually ever have to, to take these out. They'll incorporate just kind of like into the bleb. I saw one yesterday in clinic that had been done a couple of years ago and, you know, the con and the entire bleb are just like over these sutures. You can kind of see them in place, um, but they just incorporate into the bleb completely. Um, uh, this is Tenno nylon. So this is, you know, we did four of those. So this is, this is, you know, a compression suture. Okay, we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so a month later, after this compression, vision is 2060, IOP is two, still with moderate choroidals, and essentially patient is still very bothered, um, doesn't wanna wait anymore again, so decide to go for a more aggressive surgery. So the second revision, um, we opened the conjunctiva, sutured the flap down. Now we were almost expecting, you know, the flap to have melted. The flap looked beautiful. It was like perfect edges. The sides were actually sealed down. It was just, there was a tiny bit of, you know, flow at the very posterior edge of the flap. Again, we were just like, oh, this is like a perfect bleb right now. What are we doing to it? But so we put down um, five uh, nylon sutures, one on each corner and one on each um, side, just to really seal that flap down. and. Um, we had filled the eye, you know, made a couple of paracentesis, filled the eye with viscote at the beginning of the case, just to kind of stabilize the eye during the surgery. And we've, you know, closed the flap, are irrigating out the viscote just by pressing um, on the paracentesis, injecting some VSS. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the eye becomes rock hard, the AC shallows, and the iris comes to both paracentesis, just like, you know, milliseconds. Um, so we stop. The patient actually was not in pain. She did not notice anything. You know, she was, she, you know, you, you worry, you know, a patient screaming. She didn't notice anything. It was just, this is something happened. So, um, Sean, what, what might your differential be? What, what, what are we, you know, what are we concerned, most concerned about and what, what else could it be? Okay, great. Oh, yes. Were they on uh, anticoagulants? Uh, she was not on anticoagulants. I don't remember about hypertension. So, perfect. Super, super choroidal hemorrhage, um, you know, aqueous misdirection. And then this other one I'll talk about a little bit more, Aries. It stands for acute intraoperative rock hard eye syndrome. I did not actually, Dr. Chaya pointed me to that. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that at the end a little bit. So, you know, what, what do we do at this point? I was talking with Dr. Stagg uh, about this. He said, this is the most stressful situation I've ever been in inside the OR was this case right here. <laughs> it's just like, you know, there was no loss of red reflex. You know, we could still see. So we thought, you know, maybe this isn't, um, hopefully this isn't a supracoidal hemorrhage. So first thing, you know, get out of the eye. Yes, oh, okay. Um, you plus or minus, you know, if you had a main wound, definitely suture with paracentesis, iris coming to the wound. We actually did not suture. Um, we would have been suturing iris anyway. Uh, so we just, you know, we got an indirect, looked in the back. There was no loss of the red reflex. Um, the moderate choroidals that were there before surgery was still present. There was no hemorrhage. So we, we kind of thought, you know, this is, you know, a form of aqueous misdirection. We did not know this, this nice uh, acute intraoperative rock heart eye syndrome term at the time, but essentially we thought, you know, is um, 
uh, is this a form of aqueous misdirection, which, you know, what are the options here? So we could uh, close, just start Diamox. You know, she wasn't, she didn't have um, lens K touch. So, you know, if, you know, we could just watch her and, and she might deepen. Uh, we could do an IZVH. Yeah. At 6.30? <laughs> uh, so, you know, IZVH, the problem with this is this patient has choroidals. So, you know, going in, a, even at pars plana, worried about hitting the retina. Um, in this case, because they had choroidals, we do have the option of draining choroidals. You know, the, the pressure might actually flatten those out and, and soften the eye. And then this is something I'll talk about in a minute, which we had not thought of at the time, but um, I'll talk about that in a minute. So we opted to drain the choroidals. I'll show a brief video of that. Uh, it's actually not this case. So um, also this, this case, um, because it was the last case of the day, was the only case of the day that we did not get recorded. But this is, uh, you know, essentially four millimeters back from the limbus radial incision, just um, cutting down. And then eventually you'll, you will get a, a gush of, of fluid. You can see it right there. This is one I did during residency. And it, it, this patient had severe choroidals and you know it just drains and drains and drains. We did not need to put it in an AC maintainer for the case with Dr. Stagg because the eye was rock hard. But if you're, not, if you're doing this for just hypotony and, and choroidals, you'd wanna put it in an AC maintainer um, to you know, keep the flow going and to make sure the eye doesn't flatten because there's a lot of fluid in that. No. It was just just manual irrigation with you know BSS on a cannula to, to irrigate out the viscoelastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We had sutured down the flap. We were like closing up conge. It was just like we got to get the visco out. So you know, and it was when that, that's when it happened. Um. So if it. If it were, you know, aqueous misdirection, or if there weren't choroidals, you could do an IZVH, um, which one last video here. Uh, there's two of these. Um, so, you know, anterior, you, you make a, you know, anterior PI, and then you can do this just through a stab um, incision with an MVR blade. This we actually used a port. And then making sure that you can actually see the vitrector coming up through the iris and you know you've done the full thing. And then just a small, it doesn't have to be a, a thorough anterior vitrectomy. You're really just trying to break that hyaloid face. Okay, so, and if it were a supracortal hemorrhage, get out of the eye, suture wounds, um, plus or minus drain and get some religion. Um, so acute intraoperative rock hard eye syndrome, uh, was described in this case report. They they kind of coined the term, but basically, for their their cases, they had six cases, and it was during um, cortex removal. And the thought was essentially just you know the irrigation went behind some loose zonules, either hydrated the vitreous or, or you know kind of a collection of fluid just between the the posterior capsule edge and the hyaloid face. So they actually took a needle at parse plane and just stuck it in, aspirated some fluid, and the eye softened, um, and and that's how they. Um, how they treated it. Now, I, th I thought this was really cool. So I was reading through, you know, their, their uh, um, uh, work cited, but I'm, I am like thinking of all the wrong words. It's, it's citations, thank you. And um, it said, you know, the first time something like this was described was in 1994. And I, I looked up the, the authors and it was Dr. Olson, Dr. Crandall, and Dr. Mamelis back you know, 20, 26 years ago or 30 years ago. So, um, I think this is just something to 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 know, you know, rock hard eye. Um, if it's not a suprachoroidal hemorrhage, and I was talking about this with Dr. Zabriskie as well. Um, if as long as the chamber is deep, you know, you can try one of these things to soften it up, but they may just get better with time um, because if it is just a mechanical thing with you hydrating the vitreous, um, just you know, give it some time and it could uh, improve on its own as well. So any questions? Sorry, I think I might be over right now. But uh, so Dr. Stagg saw her yesterday. 
her vision is 2025. Her pressure is eight and she is not very happy. <laughs> uh, we, we one pressure was like 22. Um, and she was, you know, really worried. We were just happy she wasn't blind. It was like 22 is okay. 2025, beautiful. No, it's great. So you can do them all this way now, just the exact sequence. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Norm. So as many of you know, I've become interested in um, home tonometry and IOP fluctuation. And I'm also conflicted because I did start a company to try to get the eye care home into the, into the hands of patients. Turns out eye care will not sell directly to patients. So there was no way for patients to get access to this device. So we know that glaucoma is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy. We also know that we only have IOP as our modifiable risk factor. Clinical studies have demonstrated that if we lower the IOP, we slow disease progression. We always ask the patient or look in the chart, what's that maximum IOP? And then we target IOP. We also know IOP has diurnal and uh, nocturnal variability and fluctuation, whether they're sleeping, time of day, uh, cortisol levels, nitric oxide levels, and yoga, inverted position, it can affect their IOP. I find this fascinating. We spend a few seconds every three to four months to check a measurement where there's 31 million seconds in a year. It's also known that glaucoma progresses, right? Despite well-managed IOP. It's a chronic disease with variability. So why are we not monitoring it and managing it like we do for diabetes and high blood pressure? With a lot of these chronic diseases, we know that outcomes are better if there's multiple time points. This is a great study, which we always, I've forgotten about this, and it wasn't until Craig actually um, called my attention to this, but this was the SIGIT's nine-year study. So they randomized roughly 700 patients with advanced glaucoma, either to medications or to a trap. They found that initial surgery had a slower rate of progression, but they also found that greater fluctuation during the day, if patients had greater than or equal to 8.5 millimeters of mercury, range at that baseline vision, uh, visit, they had a 96% likelihood of visual field loss. I, I know I never asked patients about range of IOP. I've never thought of that as a risk factor, and maybe we should start thinking about it. There's several devices that are available. The triggerfish you may have heard about, it's cleared in, the, um, in Europe. It's also FDA approved. It's a device that's contact lens. It doesn't measure IOP directly. It measures um, basically corneal rigidity, changes in that rigidity, and then interprets it or converts it to an IOP. It's expensive. I don't know many people that use it. Um, eye care in plan data is a intraocular device that's put into the sulcus. There was one paper that was published in IOVS in 2015. And it actually is with, with it's not without its safety concerns. So prolonged inflammation, but this could be an option. Um, when I last looked on clinicaltrials.gov, there's no current clinical studies in the U.S. because it's a um, what's called a th class three device. They would need to do clinical studies in the U.S. to have the FDA clear it. So I don't know where they're at. And then obviously it's the eye care tonometer, which we know. So in 2017, the eye care was cleared as a home device. That's the device, the first device in the lower left. And then they went to the home two, which is much more patient friendly. It's indicated as a prescription device that's intended as an adjunct to routine clinical monitoring of IOP of adult patients. We know rebound tonometry. It's something we use in our clinic. We trust it, right? You know, I'm, I'm, 
bugging all my residents and fellows to do applination because we have become so comfortable with rebound. The FDA has accepted rebound tonometry for years in preclinical. We all know the TonoVet. Well, that's rebound tonometry. It's all based on the same premise. The eye care home has similar IOP measurements as our in-office eye care tonometry, and it's got good approximation to GAT. It's not perfect, but again, if we're looking at deltas, maybe it doesn't need to be perfect. I personally use it as a diagnostic tool, but also as a monitoring tool. So I'm gonna share some cases with you and some of the data that's actually shown that it actually could really help us understand glaucoma. This was a study that was done by the Wilmer Group. We're actually working with them. Uh, they had 107 patients. And what they did is they basically gave the eye care home to their patients. And they found that at the early waking hours between 4.30 and 8 a.m., 24% of the days in a span of weeks, in a week, seven days, those patients had a higher IOP than expected. And they found that a lot of these patients were younger men and obviously did not have filtering surgery. So their conclusion was that self-tonometry provides IOP data that can supplement in-clinic tonometry. This is one of their patients. And you can see that over the course of a week, that patient had higher IOPs in those early AM hours. I refer to it as early waking hours, but technically they're not really awake. Um, and then their IOP dropped during the day. This really gave us confidence that maybe only a week is needed to really measure the IOPs. This is a paper that was published out of Sai Morai's group um, in Ohio. She's been very active actually doing an NIH study with early onset glaucoma using the eye care home. And this is somebody, he's a 72 year old surgeon. I would, I would doubt he was non-compliant. I'd like to believe that he was compliant with his medications, but you could see again, he's controlled during the day in the clinic. His pressures are in the teens, maybe low 20s, and he's spiking to 48 in that right eye. They gave him, changed his medications, they gave him Natarsidil. It's something I don't know, I don't know if Craig has experience with this, but I've been finding that the Roclitan, the Natarsidil, the Repressa, actually seems to help with that early morning spike. Again, just as we think about what is the underlying etiology. This is a VA patient, and actually it's a patient that our neuro team had seen. So this is a 74-year-old gentleman who was diagnosed with questionable neurotension glaucoma. This was several years back. He developed a, a visual field def defect in his right eye. He had a full normal tension glaucoma workup. He had a brain MRI, Doppler, sleep apnea. He comes back to see us recently, and I thought, you know what? I wonder if he's spiking. So we got the, um, for all our VA patients, actually, we get them the eye care home for free. Um, I'm trying to work with the VA to actually get them devices that they can actually give to their patients. So anyway, he has an APD in his right eye. This is on medication. So we really don't know what his pressure is without medication. And I just raise the possibility that maybe he was spiking earlier with a greater range in that right eye. And that's why he had that visual defect. So maybe as we think about these patients, maybe we can save them some of the additional tests and maybe this could be an early first thing that we do. This is a Moran patient. This I find fascinating. So this is a patient I've chaired with Rachel. So I have had numerous colleagues look at this patient and there was no clear reason for the asymmetry in his glaucoma. No exfoliation, no trauma, no pigmentary, go on and on and on. He's got much more advanced disease in his right eye. Very little disease in his left eye. He owns the eye care home. These numbers are fascinating. He doesn't spike in that left eye. So again, is it that range? Is that the reason why his glaucoma is wor worse in his right eye? I don't know, I don't have the answer, but I think it begs the question. This is a gentleman, 67 year old, with controlled normal tension. He'd been followed at uh, Mass Eye Near for years. And he actually purchased the eye care home with a lot of difficulty back in 2020. And um, again, this was sort of the reason why we realized that other patients could benefit from it. So he was spiking into the low 20s. These are his visual fields. The question came up, what do you do with a pressure of low 20s with this visual field? And it was occurring in the early waking hours. And some of, um, some of the discussions were, 
well, maybe it's okay to have a pressure in the low 20s with these fields if that spike is early in the morning. My take was, if you came to my office with these fields and your pressure was low 20s, on maximum medication, in my clinic, I would tell you, you needed surgery. So we ended up having surgery. And again, he owns this. So this device, and it's, he ended up doing an ABIC hydrus. Actually, uh, Craig did this work. And you can see that the hydrus and the ABIC really didn't do much to lower his pressure or lower those spikes. He was still going up into the 20s. It wasn't until he had the preser flow in that right eye and has a beautiful bleb. And we bypassed the whole outflow system that he actually got more under control. So right now in that right eye, he's off medications, his pressures are good. And his left eye, the question is, is whether or not to do a preser flow. This interesting case, again, a little bit different because this is a young person, uveitic glaucoma, complaints of intermittent headaches. This is a case out of Wilmer again, that was published. And with the eye care home, they found that he was spiking to 45. They did a GAT on him. Now he responded beautifully. So is there a difference between our glaucoma patients? Perhaps all of his resistance because of the steroids was really at the trabecular meshwork and Schlem's canal. And once you unroofed that resistance, the distal outflow system was working beautifully. Another Moran patient, this is one of our SLT patients, full visual fields. She's a woman in her 60s. And every time she comes into the office, her left eye is a little bit higher than the right. She has exfoliation. We tried her on prostaglandins. She really didn't like them. And all she has is a little bit of temporal thinning on her OCT. So she opted to try an SLT. You know, we went back and forth. Do we treat you, not treat you? She did the eye care home and saw that in fact, she was spiking to 32 and she was not comfortable with that. She said, I wanna be treated. This is a beautiful response with an SLT. So she's part of our study. So I ask then the light study, six years, they came out and they showed that perhaps SLT is a safe treat. Well, we know it's a safe treatment, but perhaps it's a better option to slowing down progression. They found that more eyes in the drop arm with equal IOP exhibited disease progression, had a higher rate of TRABS, and also had a right, higher rate of cataract surgery versus those patients in the SLT. Now, granted, these were ocular hypertension, mild uh, glaucoma, treatment naive. But I'm wondering, is the SLT actually working and preventing progression because it's doing a better job of actually flattening that curve? So again, is it that range? Is it that variability that perhaps in some patients is more detrimental? So in conclusion, I found a lot of value. I've been intrigued by this from a research perspective, by an underlying physiology perspective. I still don't have a good answer. I've started measuring cortisol uh, levels on some of my patients. Um, haven't found anything. Craig and I were talking about renin aldosterone levels. Haven't found anything. Um, I think it's a great way to look at response to surgery, to lasers, also to lack of medication responses. And then in a lot of our patients too, we found that it's useful to follow them after they've had the Darista because they don't need to come to the office to tell you if their pressure's increasing. So I can manage patients um, more from a virtual manner. So next steps, we're actually working. Um, a group of us are trying to work with payers and um, insurance companies to basically get this reimbursed. I did have one patient who was able to get this covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, because again, why should it not be covered? I mean, I think this is game changing for some patients. Um, I have a lot of questions. You know, who progresses with fluctuation? Uh, what numbers are, what's the delta? What's good? What's bad? Is normal tension glaucoma real? The other thing too, if these high spikes are occurring in the early waking hours, is that also responsible for ischemic events that we see in the retina? We have two open INDs. Anybody that would like to enroll patients, um, please contact George or Cole. We have the uh, SLT study that we're doing where we're looking at patients pre-SLT pre and then post-SLT. There's no cost to them. And that's in collaboration with PRISM 
and Ike's group. And then we're also collecting all our cases between Moran and Wilmer, and then also hoping to get more cases um, from source. I think, again, the more patients we get, the more we understand the characteristics. I think we'll learn a lot about this disease. A lot of thank yous. I know Demper's in the room, could not have done this without her and her team. And then our entire glaucoma team, obviously, Susan, Rachel, Norm, Brian, Craig, everybody that sent me patients. And then obviously our residents and medical students. Did I stay under 15 minutes? <laughs> Great, thanks. No, they just submitted it. Yeah, they submitted it as a, as a device. If uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, what we needed for documentation, they submitted it. And I know we just gave them a documentation saying that it was this much money for a rental and they paid 150 bucks to the patient. And then they actually sent my eyes and said, we're so glad that we can actually help you take care of our patients. Yes. Uh, just, this is a uh, awesome work, I think, and super important, super exciting. You know, one of, the, one of the things that bothers me the most about glaucoma is there's so much we just don't know or don't understand. And I feel like this is starting to look at this a little bit. Um, I, I just think like, just looking at it, I think we need like cohort data on like all patients with glaucoma and follow a group of them for a while and see what these fluctuations mean. Um, and see, you know, how this correlates with disease progression. I just think that's super important. And we're at, in a good spot to do that here. So super exciting. I agree, Brian, 100%. Thank you. And then with that, I'll just give you one last tidbit that I didn't present talking about who progresses. Um, just quickly, 60-year-old woman, myopic, uh, tilted optic nerves, thick corneas, normal visual fields, a little bit of thinning on OCT, but she's got tilted nerves, ocular hypertensive, followed her for years gave her the eye care home. She's very data-driven. She's a PhD. She doesn't fluctuate. She goes between 22 and 24. So I, are those people less likely to progress? I, I don't know. Thank you. Anybody else? Sorry. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for both of you. And yeah, just unlimited potential on that. I mean, not only for treating patients, but for helping us understand this disease. It's just really remarkable. Okay, we will go to Sean. Okay, thanks Dr. Zabriskie. So uh, I'm gonna present uh, a couple cases to illustrate the many UGG moments we have on the glaucoma service. Uh, and then I'm curious to get people's uh, current practice patterns in the audience for how they manage this complex and uh, disease that presents in with a wide spectrum of symptoms. So I have no financial disclosures. So first case is a referral for a right eye single piece IOL that was uh, in, the, in the sulcus uh, nasally. This patient had cataract surgery done at an outside hospital back in 2019. So no case mystery here. I've given you the diagnosis already. Uh, this is a, the visual acuity was 2040. Uh, the IOP was still under control on no, medica no medications. There was two plus endo pigment and uh, the iris showed a large nasal iris uh, transillumination defect. Uh, there was suspected that the single piece acrylic lens was in the sulcus nasally. So this patient had a uh, cystoid macular edema shown on their OCT macula, probably the cause of their uh, vision finding to be down to 2040. And then uh, we had a UBM done, which showed uh, the intraocular lens implant uh, was tilted nasally, and it does appear that it is in the sulcus nasally. So I'll present a quick 20 second video. If I can press play here. So uh, here we are going in intraoperatively using iris hooks to expand the pupil and get a better appreciation of uh, this lens. We're using uh, a twist and out technique to explain plant the old uh, single piece acrylic lens. And here we are uh, doing a Yamani technique using a 30 gauge TSK thin wall needle. And that's the end of the case. The purpose of this presentation is to go over surgical videos. That was just a quick demonstration of. <laughs> What's that? 
Haptic couldn't be dunked back in the bag. And um, this, uh, I probably didn't show a good view of it, but the, uh, the capsule rexus was quite large. So it's a three-piece intraocular lens implant wasn't, uh, couldn't safely be placed in the sulcus with optic capture. There wasn't enough uh, capture support and there was an open posterior capsule. So case number two uh, is a referral for a right eye recurrent hyphema. Uh, this is a more interesting presentation as uh, this patient was managed uh, medically for five to six months at an outside institution uh, for this recurrent hyphema. So this patient had cataract surgery done 25 years ago without any issue until this past year. And this patient presented on uh, prednisolone and COSOPT uh, for management of their hyphema and their pressure. So this patient's vision was down to 2050. Uh, their pressure was 20 on the COSOPT. Uh, they had one plus cell and they had nasal transillumination defects from three to six o'clock. Uh, this patient had, uh, was pseudophagic with a mild uh, IOL tilt and pseudophagodenesis. So this patient had a UBM done again, which did show uh, a single piece uh, lens that did appear to be in the bag. However, there looked like there was a large Elschnick pearl or a proliferation of lens epithelial cells that was in contact with the iris and likely the, the cause of the UGG syndrome for this patient. Here's another view, potentially showing some IOL tilt as well. So this is the surgery that was done for this patient, uh, which again, uh, used iris hooks for, to expand the pupil. Here we can see large Sommerings ring material, which is pretty consistent with the UBM we saw. Uh, and here we are uh, prolapsing the intraocular lens into the AC. Iowal scissors were used. Uh, and now um, it was used to cut about 90% of the way through the optic, which is then explanted from the, uh, from the eye. Viscoelastic is used to burp out the remaining uh, Sommerings ring material. There was vitreous notice, so anterior vitrectomy was performed and uh, AC maintainer was placed. And again, uh, uh, three-piece intraocular lens was placed, uh, scleral fixation using a Yamani technique again here. Um, and here we are. Uh, pulling the haptic out, we flange it, and then here's the end of the case. So this patient did not have CME. So uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the end of the story for this patient. Uh, two months later, this patient then represented um, where they had the eyewall optic, which was reverse captured by the iris into the AC. Their uh, peripheral iridotomy was patent. Their intraocular pressure was fine. Um, so you can see uh, in this photo, basically the entire optic is captured uh, by the iris within the, within the anterior chamber. Uh, so 30 gauge needle was used at the slit lamp to dunk uh, the optic uh, back posterior to the iris. Uh, the patient was started on pilocarpine to kind of bring down the pupil, hopefully keep the lens optic uh, posterior to the iris. The patient was also started on moxifloxacin, moxifloxacin and pernisolone. So the next day the patient returned and the lens was in good position um, just for good measure to try to keep the aqueous outflow in a good dynamic and not have the uh, potentially, hopefully reduce the likelihood of the optic to come back anteriorly. A second uh, PI was placed uh, with the YAG laser. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this patient then returned to the home state, uh, presented to their home eye clinic, uh, complaining of uh, change in the refractive error and blurred vision. And the IOL optic had again been partially captured by the iris. So at this point, uh, given it was already, uh, given it already happened once, we already had to push the optic back. Second EIPI was already performed. Uh, the decision was made that uh, surgical intervention was warranted. So a couple options that were discussed with the patient and were considered. Uh, one was intraocular lens uh, repositioning using a masket basket technique to just to try to hold uh, the lens optic back and keep it posterior to the iris. Um, that The decision was made that that probably wasn't going to be enough for the patient. If you actually saw this patient at the slit lamp or were involved in their first surgery, the, the iris was extremely floppy, um, likely from all those recurrent episodes of hyphema and just that chronic chafing of that uh, Elschnick probe material and the lens uh, and the IOL itself with the iris. So this, so uh, Iowa repositioning using a masket back technique was not thought to be sufficient uh, to protect the patient and keep the lens optic back. So the decision was made to proceed with the pupillary cerclage. Here I'll quickly show another quick video. Uh, we're uh, using um, 
tenoproline on a CIF4 needle and using micrograspers to kind of um, uh, place the iris uh, around uh, the suture needle. That's done with one quadrant there. Uh, you can use a OVD cannula or another cannula of some sort to uh, take out uh, the suture needle. And basically you just continue this process. Um, here's Dr. Chamberlain masterfully um, using the micrograspers to uh, thread the iris over and over and over again around uh, the ten tenoproline on a CIF4 needle. Here the uh, suture knot is being thrown um, which is then pulled into the eye. And the patient was left with a round pupil, is uh, potentially a pupil a little bit on the smaller side, but definitely protective against that lens optic uh, coming forward again uh, after the surgery. So uh, quickly, I'll just go over what is UG and uh, potential takeaways. And I'm curious to get the audience some impression about how they currently uh, manage UG. So what is UG? So UG is intraocular lens chafing, causing a spectrum of findings. It was first described in 1978, describing uveitis, glaucoma, and hyphema. But uh, as we know, there's a uh, lots of other exam findings that can be noted, translumination defects, IOL tilt, uh, refractive error, uh, CME, vitreous hemorrhage, and then floppy iris and iris hypo hypotonia. So I wanted to highlight the last two uh, as uh, big pieces of the last case I presented. Most people do not talk about uh, floppy iris or iris hypotonia, hypotonia being a consequence of this disease process. But as we can see from the last case, just that repeated process of UG, uh, if we only go with medical management, can really wor worsen that iris tone and uh, predispose a patient to worsen iris tone and floppy, floppy iris. So UG uh, causes, so it was first described in 1978, secondary to ACIOLs. However, it's subsequently been associated with essentially all types of IOL placement. It can be associated with iris fixated IOLs, piggyback IOLs, single piece IOLs is our uh, big culprit a lot of the times. Um, secondary IOLs and even IOLs within the capsular bag, as we saw with that last case, weak zonules or lenticular epithelial cell proliferation uh, causing somaris ring material or alchemic pearl formation can contribute to that disease. So this is a paper, a review paper I found uh, that basically said a couple of sentences that I wanted to highlight that I thought were interesting. It says the majority of cases cause minimal symptoms and even go undiagnosed. Uh, ma majority of cases will also be transient, will resolve with topical steroids and anti-glaucoma medications, the first line of treatment. We suggest that IOL repositioning or exchange may be considered for medically refractory UG to reduce or eliminate the effect between uh, contact in the IOL and the uveal tissue. So I wanted to uh, just bring, bring this back to a discussion about when is a good time to intervene. So as we know, there's, there's not really great like universal recommendations that we can all follow for this disease process because the presentation can be so variable and each case is so case specific depending on their presentation. So uh, for the first case, you know, there was kind of those obvious findings, you know, there's CME um, and, and UBM confirmed that the IOL was placed in the sulcus there. So that's a good, pretty obvious uh, case to go ahead and surgically intervene. The second case, you know, this patient already presented to you with five to six episodes of recurrent hyphema. Um, and that was also a case where it was pretty obvious to intervene. But what about if you backtrack like maybe five episodes before that, the patient's first episode of hyphema, maybe it's kind of uh, unexplained. You only see a trace TID. Um, how would you go about managing that situation? And would you try, how long is a good time to try medical management for? Does anybody have any thoughts? Dr. Petty? So first episode of hyphema, uh, would you try medical management or would you 
would you move forward to surgery? Dr. Zabriskie, did you have a thought? Yeah, I was just going to say, certainly, um, again, it's interesting to know, CMB, CMB has a good story, but they already did this in front of all the members of the board, so I think it's good to hear. Uh, thanks. That's a C so CME, I think, is a super important driver towards, you know, fixing it. Um, the statement that was made by the authors there, that there are some that are very subtle and seem to be like a single episode. Now, I mean, I agree with that. I, so I think there is some room to watch it you know, like you've got a few cells in the ac and you think it might be ug but otherwise the patient's pretty symptom free um you know so there's there's some wiggle room there i think to kind of watch a little bit but again you know recurrence multiple hyphemas consistently elevated intraocular pressure of course those are the things that are going to drive you for sure to 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 do something like like jeff saying to you know fix the underlying problem and it might require fixing the IOL as well as doing something else you know maybe glaucoma wise or something right um, so it's a it's a you know there's a lot of art and uh, to to the treatment of UG um, you know based on symptoms based on recurrence severity those kinds of things you know it's interesting too as we always talk about UG with IOLs, and we've seen a few cases now as we put more hardware in the eye for glaucoma cases. So at the VA, we've called it UG. It was with a hydrus, so the tip of it was chafing against the iris. And then we've also had some cases with tubes, right? So always think about anything else that's in the eye as well to the residents. Um, it's that iris chafing, no matter what, what it is, whether it's an IOL or not. Bring up the point, you know, you mentioned about the floppy iris. I mean, is that causative or a consequence? I think, I think sometimes there's just a floppy iris that's banging into whatever might be there, a IOL, a tube. Um, so I think sometimes a floppy iris can be causative. I know cases that I've done where you have to go in and replace an IOL or do these things you, it's, that you're doing, it's almost always the iris is nuts, you know? And so you wonder if that's part of the etiology as opposed to a consequence. That's a good point. So this point, we already kind of went over what exam findings such as CME or uh, recurrent hyphema would tip you over to, to UG sooner. Um, how would you advise patients? So let's say you're going uh, toward the medical managed route uh, after a first episode, there's maybe a trace TID. How would you advise patients on the likelihood of their, of their UG to progress? Oh, awesome comment. Okay. Austin, if you can speak, oh, yeah. you can go ahead. Good. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, sorry, I've been trying to make a comment for a bit. Um, I, I'm sorry, I gotta rush real quick, but I just wanna make a couple of comments real quick before I go. Uh, I, I obviously get um, a, a fair number of these from a lot of you all, thank you all for sending them and we see a lot at the VA as well. Um, and obviously there's a huge spectrum in terms of what is UG and, and what is some, what is not. But um, it's true that the symptoms can range from very severe CME, uh, super high pressures, a lot of blood and hemorrhage to just a little, almost like a mild bit of cell and patients just notice that things are kind of a little bit different. Um, and a lot of times the only way we find out these things is if we go and intervene and do something about it, and uh, and then it gets better. Um, and I just want to uh, make uh, two examples, although there's many. Um, that I had one case of a Yamane IOL, uh, I mean a Yamane fixed IOL that was uh, apparently causing some form of UG. I went in there, and it seemed like the Yamane was in perfectly um, was in perfect position and was actually far enough from the limbus. But I said, well, I mean. Uh, I'm in here, I, I got to do something. So I took it out and I basically moved the haptics uh, maybe like a couple of millimeters away um, uh, in terms of clock hours, a little bit more nasal temporal. And then I also pushed it back maybe about 0.5 millimeters from the limbus. And that patient has never had problems since with CME or any of these other symptoms. Another thing is um, uh, a point that's made by a lot of uh, uh, 
Yamane surgeons who do this quite frequently is that um, this can happen, uh, and I'm talking specifically UG after Yamane, and a number of PIs typically have to be made before an interve surgical intervention should be made. And I discovered this myself because I had a patient um, who had a very similar situation to the one that you presented. In fact, it might be the same patient anyway. Um, and I, I did a P and, and we kept pushing it back with a 30 gauge needle uh, and, and um, pushed him out of capture and he would capture like a few seconds later. So I went ahead and, and did a PI um, he already had one nasal, I did one temporal and inferior. And during one of those PIs that I did, um, it immediately uh, came out of capture uh, as soon as I did that PI. And that's, this is the second or third PI that was done. So typically um, think about making more than one PI before you, um, before you intervene surgically. Um, the last thing I wanna say is that this can actually happen more frequently than people think with a bag uh, with a IOL that's in the bag as well and the thought uh, in that case is it might have to do with some floppy um, floppy iris in conjunction with um, weak zonules as well so anyway I could talk a lot more about this subject but I just want to make those points clear before I kind of run off thanks yeah Sounds good. Here are some takeaways. Uh, importance of UVM as an imaging modality. Uh, consider intervening er earlier in the disease process. Take a thorough history, request prior op notes uh, when considering UG and the differential diagnosis. And uh, if you can, it's also ideal to consider the patient satisfaction with their existing IOL. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh.